Well, good evening, everybody. The time is upon us. And before we start, um, I'd want to say welcome to another of our Stonington Free Library Sunday evening lecture series. My name is Belinda Decay. I'm Director Emeritus of the Library. And before we start, just two things. Please make sure your cell phones are silenced. And second, I want to thank our staff and volunteers of our program committee, and especially staff member Millie Donovan, who oversees all the details and makes sure everything runs smoothly, so I don't have to, which is wonderful. And she's supported this evening by our director, Michaela Hall. So thank you, all of you. Also, I want to mention our next Sunday evening program, another important date for your calendar. On October 8th, the nationally acclaimed and distinguished poet Henri Cole will be reading from his new collection of sonnets. Professor Cole is also a friend and neighbor who recently became a borough resident. So this is going to be a very important event for us. All our programs can be found on our website. And if you have a library card, you receive email information about everything going on at the library and timely reminders of our programs. So if you want to sign up for a library card, you could leave that information at the desk and we will see that you get a library card. And then you will be added to our email list. And now it is my privilege and honor to welcome our speaker this evening, Joseph Alkermes, Professor of Ancient and Medieval Art at Connecticut College. His expertise ranges from the art and architecture of the Roman and early Christian worlds to that of the Byzantine Empire and its links to Western Europe. He has lived in Rome for a long time and we could not have anyone better qualified to take us on a magical mystery tour of this ancient city and civilization, a tour that promises a tantalizing and different view of places both familiar to many of us and unknown. I was just thinking this afternoon that the mission of the library is to enrich our community. And I'm just thinking that here, now, and in this place, that's exactly what we're doing. So thank you for giving us so generously of your time to share your love and deep knowledge of Rome with us. We are very fortunate to have you here to, with us today. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Alkermes. <laughs> we have to trade. I'm old enough so that when I, when I went to graduate school in New York, I worked with expat German professors and, and in Rome and around up there. Uh, one used to uh, refer to microphones as speakeasies. <laughs> His English was perfect. He knew what a speakeasy was, but he uh, transferred. And I suppose it helps. Yes, yeah, so this is the clip on one. This is the one that will keep us looking for the live stream. And this and is the one that I'll bang my chin yes, on. Yes, exactly. Excellent, good. Very good. Well, thanks very much, Belinda, for those kind words of introduction. Thank you, Millie and uh, Michaela, for all the organization tonight. As I look around the room, I'm floored by the crowd. I hope I don't disappoint. And I. Um, I'm thinking, I thought as I prepared this talk, well, I actually did prepare it. This isn't, it wasn't flung together at the last minute. Uh, thought about how many wonderful occasions I've had here in the library and at other institutions. It, it, a little louder? In, yeah, how's that, better? I can lean in a bit, good. All the, the wonderful occasions on which um, presentations and talks here in the library and elsewhere that provided both delight and enlightenment. I see many people in the room who, uh, who deliver those talks and presentations. And I have, I, I'm, I'm not saying this reproachfully. Why did you set the bar so high? Uh, I think I'll kind of sidestep it. There won't be any thesis here. There won't be any through line, sorry. Uh, 
there will be more than 15 works. I cheated a little bit on that. They're not really my favorites in any real sense. That would be at least 115, if not 1,500 works. So it's a selection of works that many are, are well known. You've seen them, those of you who've been to Rome, but you may not have seen the, the feature that I want to point out. Is that better, Ken? Set for audio, good. Uh, and others just aren't very well known at all. So with that out of the way, that uh, sort of fumbling <laughs> pro-am, let's get started. With Rome, 15 sites, sites. You'll notice that I'll use Roman numerals throughout. <laughs> that the font, it's, not, it's definitely not my favorite font, but it's yes, times, uh, right. You all know what it is better than I. I know the color scheme is a little garish, but there's a point here too. It's the colors of the Rome soccer club. And before getting to, this, the, to the, the heart of the matter here, I want to introduce some of you, I imagine, to the most spectacular map I think cre ever created of Rome, the Noli Plan, as it's generally known, cre uh, uh, compiled by a cartographer named Giambattista Noli in the mid middle of the 18th century, created for the Pope, for, Gregory, uh, for Benedict XIV, the Lambertini Pope. It's enormous. It's about um, 68 inches on the short side. So a, a, a really splendid document of the city as, as it existed then with much of what uh, preceded the 18th century city visible in the plan part over here and in the monuments, the ancient monuments on the left, and the glories that were created in the Renaissance, Baroque, and 18th century, contemporary with the, uh, with the Pope that commissioned this thing. No other map created, created in the city before or after has quite this level of information, and it's really quite a remarkable work. I wanted you all to know about it. I'll also point out that it's recently been republished, so it's something that you can acquire if you want. So with the Noli plan in everyone's mind, let's move beyond it and uh, start this kind of quirky and certainly unscientific um, selection of works, the main criterion for which is, as I said, uh, for selection is, is uh, that they're, uh... no, we're not going to talk about this. I thought I'd flash it up there quickly. <laughs> we'll not, not deal with the Sistine Chapel or, or really with much of, of the Vatican, nor will we uh, spend time with this work by Gian Lorenzo Bernini. So kind of gliding by much of the uh, uh, high Renaissance and the Baroque period with these very famous monuments. We won't do catacombs, nor aqueducts. I really recommend going out to the aqueduct park uh, that, of which the Claudian aqueduct in the top slide is, is part. It's really a spectacular place and uh, a lovely bit of countryside that sort of inserts itself into the city. We won't do the Trevi Fountain. <laughs> That's the last of the things we won't do. I want to. I want to work. Start with a, a much smaller, um, intimate fountain in Piazza Mattei, number fifteen in Rome, the Fontana delle, delle Tartarughe. I'm losing my Italian. Uh, designed by Giacomo della Porta, an important late Renaissance architect in the city in the 1580s. His original design included the basin, the main basin below, the shell basins, the bronze boys riding dolphins, and the basin on top. The uh, idiosyncratic, inexplicable, but entertaining addition of the turtles uh, is said to have been an, uh, from an, an idea, a suggestion of Gian Lorenzo Bernini, and his name will come up again. Whether it was Bernini or not is a matter of debate. We can't debate, though, whether it's, it's clear that they are, um, they make a wonderful addition. Number 14, for the ancient Roman specialists in the room, a bust of Commodus in the Capitoline Museums of the thousands of emperor portraits. And I'm not talking about coins. I mean, three-dimensional portraits in bronze, stone, uh, silver, and so on. This is, to my mind, the most over the top, this image of the emperor Commodus. We see that he's the muscled Hercules type with the club and the lion skin and the apples of the Hesperides that he's got in his hand. It's more like crab apples here. In other representations, they're much larger. But he's no beefy brute as Hercules is often represented in the Roman world. On the contrary, he's really the picture of elegance with the lion's paws knotted so 
so precisely over his over his breastbone, one one uh, paw side up, the other paw side down. Really wonderful. The, uh, his hair and beard beautifully groomed, and that kind of preening facial expression. Has everyone seen uh, the Ridley Scott film Gladiator? So Joaquin Phoenix really bore no resemblance <laughs> to the uh, to the real Commodus. There are elements of truth, you know, of historic, that are historically accurate in the in the film, and one is um, is Commodus's uh, pride in his gladiatorial expertise. It wasn't all fantasy on, on Scott's part. Now the Capitol Museums is are, are my favorite museum complex in the city. I know that's kind of heretical to say, so we're, we're not going to leave right away. On the way to, to the Commodus, I recommend that you stop to see some things that are very well known, like the Lupa Capitolina, the standard older interpretation is that it's a work of is a work of circa 500 BCE or a, a bit later, mid fifth. Relatively recently, it was proposed that it's a work of medieval art, medieval sculpture, and I think that it's trending. Although we have experts in the room who can uh, correct me on this, the general trend is to uh, not want to wrench it from antiquity and plunk it into the Middle Ages. Leave it. The idea is in the fifth century, where it's been happy for so long. One more ancient work, certainly ancient work, in the galleries is this spectacular bust, the Fonseca bust, an image of uh, a, a woman of the Flavian or early Flavian period, late first or early second century C, a woman of rank, an extraordinary piece in terms of technique uh, and, and a conveying of the remarkable grace of the sitter, like the turn of the head, the, uh, the gaze in the distance, and that extraordinary hair with the running drill used to perforate the ringlets. Uh, it's really remarkable that it's so well preserved after 1900 or so years of, uh, after 1900 years. One more pair, I forgot that I threw these in at the last minute, two lovely portraits of second century, of mid second century members of the imperial family. Faustina the Younger on the left, the daughter of the emperor Antoninus Pius, and on the right, her husband, Marcus Aurelius, the father of Commodus, so it's all sort of coming full circle. Uh, obviously, it, it, as youths, she was about 17 probably when this image was done, uh, celebrating the, uh, the birth of their first child. And he, his image, a decade or so earlier, uh, pictures him uh, not long after he became crown prince. I find these two portraits really moving in the way in which they represent people of the highest rank, but also you know, in a way sort of susceptible or, or uh, very much of this world. Okay, that was a long 14, I know. Let's move on to 13. Here we've, we've set ourselves firmly in the Middle Ages, no doubt about this too, the Church of San Clemente, the wonderful uh, main space of the building as it is today, several feet, more than several feet about, six feet, I think, or eight feet below the current ground level. This is the 12th century level that the church is at, built beginning probably in 1099 and completed within a, within a generation with a significant restoration in the early 18th century, but nothing that really disturbs the, uh, the, the furnishings in marble inlaid with colored stones and gold, gold ground mosaic bits, wonderful mosaic in the apse, and the uh, uh, spectacular marble floor of a type that's really common in Rome in the 11th and 12th centuries, and uh, though restored here, preserves its original pattern. What's most interesting about this church, there are other churches like this in Rome, a handful, at least five or six, that have many of the same features, but what they lack is everything that's underneath San Clemente, this wonderful overlay, palimpsest of periods. So at the top, you have current day street level, the atrium, and 12th century church level, and below it, the fourth century church, one of the earliest datable church buildings in Rome, and below that, third and second and first century CE buildings, and other structures and st street pattern that dates back to the first, the second and first centuries BCE. So this is an extraordinary uh, accumulation, a pileup of phases in the development of Rome that give you a 
a, an unparalleled sense of the texture of the city over the 2,500 years that this site's been, been developed. A quicker number, whatever that was, quicker. Now we're on to 12. Uh, moving back to the early Christian period, another church with impressive mosaics, the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore, really rather stick to the Italian name, St. Mary Major somehow is disconcerting <laughs> with its wonderful restored but uh, spectacular uh, inlaid marble pavement, <laughs> pavement, the reused columns perfectly matched that were taken from some imperial monument and, it's, and used to construct the building when it was laid out in the 430s under Pope Sixtus III. There's a series of mosaics, some missing, some were removed when changes were made to the church in the 16th century. The uh, mosaics that picture mainly episodes of heroic military behavior um, as the Israelites assert themselves in their world that offer an interesting and in some ways an inexplicable contrast or counterfoil to the mosaics of the arch in front of the apse, which picture scenes from the life of Christ and Mary, some of which are easily, easily connected with episodes that appear in, the, in scripture, others not, and people have puzzled over these for the last 150 years exactly what's going on and how the, uh, how the, how the two sets of mosaics come. That set was added, a space that's perpendicular to the, to the nave over here, and uh, a new apse created. It has some of the most, um, most spectacular late 13th century mosaics created in the city. Mosaics by the master, master of mosaicist, a man named Jacopo Torriti. Uh, so this church offers much uh, from many periods, from the 5th to the 13th, and, and later still to the late 15th century, and later than that, there's an important Michelangelo chapel in this building. The ceiling, I'll just leave, end with that, was uh, gilded in the 1490s, the, the crest of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, oh my dear. Alexander, he thought he was great. Alexander the Sixth, uh, the Borgia Pope, is on the ceiling. He's the one who engineered all of this. And it's said that uh, gold brought back from the New World was used in this um, work of late 15th century embellishment. OK. 11, we're going from Santa Maria. Santa Maria to um, Princess Paulina. I know that many of you know this extraordinary work in the uh, gallery in Villa Borghese, like Galleria Borghese, housing today the spectacular collection that was begun by Cardinal Scipione Borghese in the early 17th century. The current arrangement is, um, it was, is later than that. It was uh, uh, laid out in the 1770s, I think. And that's the, the context in which the, for which this statue was made by Antonio Canova in the early 19th century, 1803 or so, I think is the date, I've forgotten it. Um, Paulina, Napoleon's sister, married a Borghese prince and resided in Rome uh, and commissioned a portrait of Canova. The original idea was that she'd be rep represented as Diana. Uh, the chaste goddess of the hunt and the moon, but she that that was not acceptable. She preferred Venus, and and so Canova uh, tempered the scandalous the scandal a bit by uh, picturing her as semi nude, but um, scandal it was nonetheless. I think she is holding something in her left hand, an apple. So that she, she clearly Venus. This is the apple that um, that. Aphrodite slash Venus received from Paris in the judgment of Paris. And it's not all vanity. Uh, the Borghese family claimed that they were descended from Aeneas, from the Trojan prince, uh, with connections, uh, who's, who was son of Venus. Number 10. I'm moving along a little more quickly than I expected. I'm glad I brought dessert in addition to this 15 course tasting menu. So we're going from a, a, a neoclassical semi-nude figure to a Renaissance semi-nude figure, this time a nymph, though, a little less uh, scandalous. 
in a building that today is known as the Villa La Farnesina. Uh, that's not its original name. It was, it, originally, it was associated with its, not with the Farnese family that acquired it in the 1570s, but with one of the richest men in Italy, one of the richest men in Europe, a man named Agostino Chigi, and I'll come back to talk about him in just a minute. What I want to focus on here is this wonderful illusionistic fresco, one of relatively few, like quite like this anyway, done by Raphael around the year 1512, as he and members of his extended workshop worked on the decoration of this villa. All of it, practically all of it done within a generation or so in the teens and 20s. Uh, you see that Raphael here has very um, adeptly painted at, below the, the scene, the mythical scene, a drape that illusionistically reproduces, you know, some heavy, rich fabric. The frame has figures in scrolls, myth, myth figures in scrolls that are inspired by something that Raphael himself had recently visited, the Golden House of Nero, Nero's Domus Aurea, that he and other Renaissance artists explored uh, in the um, late 15th and early 16th century. So a couple of different artistic impulses at work here. And then the main scene with this episode from myth featuring Galatea, not in the usual way in which he's pursued and, 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 and uh, abducted by, by, the, uh, by a Cyclops, by Polyphemus. Zoom in on it. Here we see that instead she's love smitten. She's thinking about her love interest. Uh, Achi is his name. As three cupids descend on her, and she scuds along on a sort of Venus-like shell uh, on the water with uh, sea creatures cavorting around her. A perfect um, summary of the sorts of pleasurable activities that went on in the villa. Kiji was, Agostino Kiji was a, 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 a very important patron of the arts, as this commission and many others make clear. He was also a great entertainer who had lavish dinner parties at the villa and on the lawn adjoining the Tiber River. And one chronicler tells us that at the end of the parties, he'd tell his guests to pick up their dishes that were made of gold and silver and throw, throw them over the bank into the water. What he didn't note was that he had servants down there with nets to catch the, the dishes before they, before they sank and were lost. So he was uh, ostentatious and um, parsimonious, well, not parsimonious, a good Sienese banker in the end. Here we go to nine. Very, very different in tone. Not so far off in date, but a painting that's very, very different in tone. One of the paintings by uh, Caravaggio, the late 16th and early 17th century painter that I find most, most impressive. Uh, one of a pair of paintings in the Cerasi Chapel in Santa Maria del Popolo at the northern end of the Centro Storico in Rome. Um, on your way to this chapel, which is at the the end of the, the left aisle, pause for a moment and you'll see Agostino's tomb monument, his burial chapel with its pyramids and elements that uh, were intended to bring to mind the, the burial and place of commemoration of his sort of namesake, the Emperor Augustus. So here, to turn to the painting at hand, this picture is the uh, execution, the martyrdom of Peter, its companion panel on the wall opposite, the uh, uh, conversion of Paul as he falls from his horse, after he falls from his horse on the way to Damascus. I, I prefer, I mean, I'd rather talk about this one because the drama is, is palpable. Peter straining on the cross, realizing that there's no way out. Uh, the muscled bodies that, are, 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 that continue from the Renaissance, but all set in a kind of tenebrous atmosphere, this darkness that's characteristic of Caravaggio with sharp contrast between light and dark. I won't go all art historical on you, but chiaroscuro, light, dark, is a, a, a painting contrast that Caravaggio really mastered and that he passed on to his many followers. He and the artist, his contemporary artist, his name will come up again twice, I think, Annibale Caracci, very, very different in style, uh, are key figures for the development of Baroque, later Baroque 17th century painting in Rome, and elsewhere in Europe. So we're looking at a work here that's kind of a kernel of, of further development. Caravaggio got a lot of guff, much criticism in his day for the kinds of people that he painted, people who were ordinary, 
uh, rankled with the Roman, especially well, clerical and and uh, uh, aristocratic elite. Uh, critics complained that he painted people with dirty feet. Peters are filthy, but uh, he is the prince of the Roman Church, nonetheless. On to number eight. Back to antiquity, to uh, a Roman period copy of what was an original, what was originally a bronze, done by I think one of the most um, inventive sculptors of the classical period in Greece, a man named Lysippus. It's been in the Vatican collections since the 17th century, I think. I'll have to check the date here. And it's in a room all by itself, just before you get to the octagonal courtyard that the Laocoon and other really well known Apollo Belvedere and other famous works are, are displayed in. You, you reach this. And um, when I first went to Rome, and I think you, you have a similar memory, you could go into that room, right, Tali? Yeah, it's been cordoned off for I don't know how long. It's such a shame that uh, you can't experience this work the way you were supposed to. With this athlete shown scraping himself, we'll get to that in just a minute, uh, with his arm extended over your head. The base that it's on is not original, but I have no doubt that a, a base about that height was, was the intended pedestal, the height of the pedestal intended by Lysippus for the display of the original bronze. So now I am going to get sort of art historical on you and talk a little bit about the tradition in classical Greece of athlete statues done in, mainly in bronze, but some the originals, the originals in marble. Uh, the um, that way. Okay, thank you for that. Should stop moving too. Yeah. Right, yeah, that's hard. So I was yes, Lysippus and athlete statues. Yes, the kinds of statues that were dedicated after an athlete won a significant victory. A victory is everything. The Olympic Games or the Pythian Games, the Nemean Games, the Games at Isthmia, the, the big uh, uh, Pan-Hellenic celebrations that attracted people from all over the Greek world. This is the fifth century tradition. Again, Roman period, mid fifth century by Polyclitus on the left and Myron on the right, picturing athletes presumably won the events that they were engaged in. Spear bearer, you can see what the discus thrower competed in. And there are clear differences between these figures and that, of, uh, that done by Lysippus in, the, in what they're shown doing, first of all. What's the spear bearer doing? Well, not much. He's kind of relaxed, composed, and restrained after after winning, after uh, being awarded the prize, while the discus thrower is shown at the, at the top of his backswing, about to start the, the, the motion that will end with the launch of the discus and win him that prize. So the point that I want to make is that we're looking at statues here that um, picture the athlete, athlete either quietly glorying in victory or engage and actually engage in the event that won him the prize. What's the, the Athlete scraping himself doing? He's cleaning himself after the match. Athletes and, and comp you know, internationally competitive athletes, like people who won the Olympics, and lesser athletes boil themselves before exercise and before performance, before competition, and scrape the oil off with a sort of uh, spatula afterwards. So he's shown in the locker room here, basically. Not the same kind of dignified and, and traditional pose. Lysippus is really good at tweaking tradition, playing with tradition. He changes the proportions of figures, giving this, this athlete a much longer, more, in some ways more live body, uh, heavier proportions of the figures that we were just looking at. And here, let's look for a minute at the facial expressions, especially of the discus thrower. What kind of mood is projected by these figures? Discus thrower uh, in particular. He's really straining. His body is straining, but there's no reflection of that effort on his face. Let's compare that to the expression on the athlete scraping himself's face. Looks like he's kind of 
running through, running a replay of the event in his mind. Yes, Jenny. Like, yeah, not much closer. I'll be, um, well, let's see if we can tilt it up. I can hold it. Is that better? Oh, that's too good. Let me back off a minute. An expression that's um, not, not quizzical. I'm, I'm losing the word for it. Uh, it does, it's not the clear restraint and control. It, it, it's, it, 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 maybe it's just me. No, is that better? Okay. Okay. All right. I've always thought, looking at the, yeah, this is not easy. Scrunch, scrunch down, I'll squat a bit. The, um, in the many years that I've reflected on this piece, I, I've, I've wondered whether, well, I've thought that, you know, if he, had, if, if he didn't receive the statue, you might wonder whether he won the event or not. But of course he did, um, because, because Lysippus was commissioned to make an image of him. That was a little tortuous, that logic, but I think we all got it. On to seven. I, I'll just, yeah. Back to the, to the early Middle Ages, to the Carolingian period in Rome, uh, to a chapel adjoining the church of Santa Prasede, built by a pope. The church was built by a pope, and the chapel was, was as well, uh, connected with the um, celebration of his mother. She was alive when the building was built. Uh, it's about twice the size, a little bit bigger, I should say, than the chapel with the Caravaggio in it. So it's quite small and dazzling in its decoration. Marble floor, marble panels up to a height of about 10 feet. And then above that, gold ground mosaics with the images that you see, a bust of Christ holding a scroll and blessing at the center, held up by four angels standing on pedestals that mark the corners, mark the edge, well, the angels mark the edges of the, the uh, cross vault that they decorate. And below, uh, various saints, Peter and Paul, straight ahead, pointing up to the ready throne, the throne that Christ will descend from heaven to sit on at the end of the world, with uh, figures in para paradisical settings on the sides. It's really a, a, a breathtakingly intense uh, experience, entering this glittering, this glittering cube and uh, seeing the deity and his saints in paradise at such a close remove. On to six. This is kind of hard to find. If you don't know that this is on the second floor of the Novitiate building, the uh, uh, Jesuit in training building next to the church of Sant'Andrea al Quirinale, you'll never find this. Extraordinary early, early, uh, 19, early, pardon, early 18th century sculpture done by Pierre Le Gros, Frenchman who was brought to Rome by Jesuits. I think I'll mention that in a minute too, in the middle of the uh, preceding decade, in the middle of the, the 1690s. It pictures uh, a, a young man named Stanislav Kostka, Polish teenager, uh, very devout, who wanted to become a Jesuit and wanted to do it in Rome. So without his parents, without waiting for his parents' approval, which he felt sure he wouldn't get, he walked to Rome in 15, I've forgotten the date, 1578, sometime in the second half of the 16th century. And uh, arrived, was accepted in the novitiate, was given this room in the novitiate. And after a year of really intense spiritual exercises, um, infirm person that he was naturally, he died in this room. And that's what's pictured here. Stanislav on his deathbed, uh, engaged with, get a little closer, with a rosary and an image, the rosary in the right hand, an image in the left. I have a lot of slides of this, so let's take in this, these, this extraordinary work. None of the stone is, is artificially colored. That is, these are the, the black, the white, the yellow, and the browns are all the uh, natural tints of the marble, marbles and other stones that are used. Get a little closer. The, the uh, Embroidered hem of that pillowcase is remarkable. A little closer to that. Closer still. I think we should leave him alone now. But I do have one more. 
you see the rosary really clearly in his right hand. This is what's in his left. Yeah, a miniature of an icon, Our Lady of Chestahova, that I brought along there for you to see. So he's got this, at his last moment, he has with him uh, a treasure that he brought from home, reunited in a way with his, with his the place of origin. Number five. We're still in Jesuit territory here, but not on the Quirinal. We've moved down to the Jesuit heartland, the area just east of the Pantheon, where still today there's a lot of Jesuit activity. And, and one of the two main Jesuit churches in town, the Church of Sant'Ignazio, with its spectacular ceiling decoration, designed by a Jesuit mathematician named Pozzo. The man who brought um, who brought Le Gros to Rome is a not a detail, a full view taken from the right from the correct spot. The, uh, the the imagery represents God at the center. Up here, I have a, I'll have a detail of this in a minute. With um, light transmitted from him to Christ and then to Sant'Ignazio, to Saint, Saint Ignatius, and through him, let's just cut to the chase there. Oh no, I should point this out. Through him to the four continents on which Jesuits were active. Let's start over here with us, the Americas. Um, uh, Africa, Asia, and Europe. What were the Jesuits doing in Europe in the 16th and 17th and, and 18th, well, 16th and 17th centuries for sure. Missionaries, yes, in those other continents, they were major figures in counter-reformation activities, trying to combat the uh, peeling away of many from the Catholic Church begun a century and a half earlier. Here's a detail that shows the main figures. And isn't that really remarkable? The light descending and then sort of beamed out to the four continents um, as it bounces off Ignatius's body. The um, designer of the building, the person responsible for most of the design, a, a man named Carlo Maderno, we'll be talking more about him when we get to another much more famous example of his work. Uh, he did the bulk of the design for the nave, and there was a plan to, to build a dome, too. You see that from this point of view, it looks like that dome was built. But actually, no, it's an illusionistic dome. It's a trompe dome designed by the same Jesuit mathematician and sort of scenographer that did the nave. And as you look at it from this viewpoint, the correct viewpoint, because that's the way one-point perspective works, right? There's an ideal viewpoint, and things start to shift if you're not in that spot. Looks good from here with the uh, cup of the dome rising up nicely and the curved far wall uh, kind of unfolding in front itself in front of you. If you go off to the left, Oh, I, I forgot I had this detail. Looks good. It's even better when you have a detail like this. Go off to the left and, and see what happens. No, you want to snap back into the right position here, I think, and uh, take the dome in the way it was meant to be seen. Closing in, number four, the Pantheon. I, okay, yeah, I know you know the Pantheon. Uh, I, when I introduced myself, I meant to point out that in my many, many years of you know, many, many years in Rome, I think that I've probably been in the Pantheon a thousand times, maybe more, maybe 2,000. I stopped. I never counted. I just kept going. And I know that many, many of you in this room have been there. And you've probably never had this view. Um, I had the, the really good fortune of actually not, not seeing it from here, but seeing the dome close up and personal uh, on two occasions, walking up those steps. I'll tell people about the experience both times afterwards, walking up these steps to get to the oculus, to that big round window that we see here. And here the interior in a wonderful 18th century painting that shows it better than most photographs can. So you know, you know, so I didn't need to bring that. What are people doing in this painting? Well, there are a couple of people engaged in devotion. It had been a church since 609. Uh, when this, by the time this painting was done, it had been a church for over 1,100 years. And there are a few people praying at various points, many people socializing. This is the group that interests me the most, this group that's sort of transfixed by what they're looking at, some kneeling, some not. They're looking at what this girl is looking at. These th three or four people are foolishly not paying attention to it. 
This is the tomb of Raphael, recorded the extraordinary honor of burial in the Pantheon when he died in 1520. And I have a story about that too that I'll tell you afterwards if you're inter interested. No, I wasn't there for the ceremony, but. Uh, <laughs> A reused Roman sarcophagi, sarcophagus was, uh, re was inscribed with, with his name and uh, an, ins uh, an epigraphic tribute. And he receives honors regularly. Flowers are very often, off uh, are very often uh, on uh, placed at his grave and people like me pay attention to it. Uh, his later contemporaries paid attention to it as well. Anibale Caracci, the painter whose name has come up a couple of times already, painter uh, from Bologna who came to Rome I think in the 1580s and spent the rest of his life in Rome, died in Rome at the age of 49 in 1609, I think. His wish was to be buried near Raphael. And he got it. This is his gravestone over here. And here we see it close up with his name, uh, Raphael's name and uh, a very flattering inscription that kind of makes them equal. Uh, I think even he might have been embarrassed by something like that. But, uh, a, a devoted follower of hers, a painter named Carlo Maratti, uh, created the, you know, paid for the, organized the burial and composed the inscription and uh, this is how we remember it. Number three. Finally, yes, a Bernini. The, a much less well-known Bernini. In a chapel, we've crossed the river now, we're in Trastevere, in the church of San Francesco Ripa, very close to the river bank, Ripa in Italian. A chapel that on a much smaller scale reproduces, or includes many of the same kinds of features that we see in the, uh, the famous Cornaro chapel that I flashed on the, on the screen very briefly at the beginning of this presentation. An image that represents a woman named Ludovica Albertoni, who was um, uh, an important figure in Roman ecclesiastical spiritual circles in the early 16th century. Not long after her death, a movement was underway to have her canonized. It never got very far, and it was resumed again in the 17th century when Bernini, it was one of his last works, um, designed this chapel to uh, honor her and to bring to public attention. Uh, the, the, her cause, the, the move towards canonization. She's, she's a, step sort, a step short of saint here. She's a beata, not a santa. Um, and there she remained. The, the floating angel heads, the uh, brilliantly carved cloth made of stone that is that color, imitating uh, heavy drapery, and especially details like this as we get a little closer closer still, this um, image of a, uh, a woman in spiritual ecstasy. Number two, pure architecture coming up, people. I know it's hard to get when we're not in the building, but I think I've got enough going here so that we can do it. Oops. Francesco Borromini, the great Baroque architect, uh, contemporary and I think exaggeratedly in, by, by many, uh, described as arch rival of Gian Lorenzo Bernini. I think that this is his masterwork, a church dedicated to Saint Ive, uh, Santivo, alla Sapienza. Not well known because it's almost impossible to get into, and it's tucked away in a courtyard. It's in a very central location. The Pantheon is about 350 feet beyond it, or, you know, the other side of the dome, and Piazza Navona is closer than that in the direction behind the person taking this photograph. So it's really at the heart of an important part of the city, but um, inaccessible in so many ways. Set in a courtyard that was, <clears throat> that predates it. That was the, uh, the, the um, uh, location of the university in the 16th century, the Sapienza, the University of Rome. The main uh, unit of the University of Rome is still today is called the Sapienza Wisdom. So the Sapienza in, in this, with this courtyard complex that was laid out in the 1580s by an architect whose name has come up several times already, Giacomo della Porta. A chapel was to be added, but not, not completed by him. And in the uh, uh, middle of the century, I think in the 1640s, Baramini got the commission for it. 
I want to point out before we go inside is the way in which Barmini plays with the rectangular courtyard out front, finishing it with a concave element here that picks up the forms of the colonnades at two levels to the right and left. So he, they're, they're arches that aren't open, but the same arched forms framed with architectural elements are used in this new 17th century component. And then above that, he does all kinds of wonderful inventive things. He lays down what from the outside looks like a four-lobed unit with this lobe countering this concave, concave pardon me, convex lobe countering the convex space below. And then above that, this lantern returns to <coughs> scooped form, picking up what was done on the ground floor. And then above that, this spiral top with, go to the next one. Sorry, here I'm choked with emotion. And there at the very top, this spiral that ends in a flaming crown and the, uh, the lightning rod and cross. I've seen incredible lightning storms striking this building from the library of the French school in Palazzo Farnese. It's a dessert item. I hope we have time to, to look at it. Uh, it's, it, it. That was an extraordinary experience and entering the building even more remarkable. Yeah, I think back to the uh, to Sant'Ignazio with its brilliant polychrome paintings. Now there's no, there are altarpieces in this building, but above the above them, really nothing. It's all gray and white with a bit of gold. So nothing interferes with our understanding for with our uh, taking in of the architecture. Understanding it is a lot more complicated because Boramini has used a very complicated. Um, geometric system for laying down the plan. And I'm not going to go into detail here. S superimposed uh, tri equilateral triangles with circles whose uh, diameter is determined by the uh, intersections of those triangles and uh, a circular form above that. So it's really quite a sophisticated scheme. And it's a shame that the only time that this building is accessible, I think it's very hard even to get permits for it. The only time that you can go to see it is before or after Sunday Mass. And I don't think that they post the time of Sunday Mass. So it's really, it is 11 o'clock? Okay, good. I tried to go this year, I didn't manage it. Okay, here we are. Don't be disappointed by number one. Because yes, it's something that you all know. It's St. Peter's Basilica, it's the Vatican Basilica at uh, one of the most remarkable works of um, architecture by committee uh, that ever imagined with uh, the Milanese architect Bramante starting it all in 1506 and work not completed if we count in sig really significant interior decoration until about 270 years late, no, 170 years later, the arithmetic is lacking today too, by John Lorenzo Bernini. I'm not going to go through all of the phases because I'm not really interested in the building that we have here today. What I want to do is take you down below it, but I can't just head downstairs without uh, a nod in the direction of these wonderful elements. The Moderno facade, the Moderno nave, Michelangelo's dome, outside and inside, Bernini's um, Baldacchino, that huge bronze canopy, uh, in a really, I think, a lovely 18th, 19th century watercolor, I think a major papal event and election going on. And now, finally, the point that I want to, the element that I want to emphasize, everything that's underneath it. So this is the pro, this is the plan of the Renaissance Baroque building, right, outermost. This is Constantine's church here that you see in reconstruction, a reconstruction that's. I think accurate, credible in all its major details because the footprint of the building survives under the 16th and 17th century church that we have. It's all there. It's down at the level where papal tombs are, like John Paul II's, uh, John Paul I is down there, Paul VI, John XXIII, all the way back to um, Sixtus IV. There's a whole series of, of papal tombs that are at that level that are, that's easily accessible. You enter it by going down those steps that are in the crossing. What I'm interested in is what's below that. This row of, this, this graveyard, 
graveyard that was established in the first century CE uh, and was given very simple graves in the middle and later first century CE, and then built up more heavily with more elaborate tombs, and mausoleum buildings, and so on, so that um, its original character was transformed by later building. But and in, for Christians in Rome, what was believed to be a really important burial site was not tampered with. In fact, it was, it was embellished, improved on. And that's the, the tomb of Peter that was brought into Constantine's building in a way at great effort. Uh, the, the Vatican hillside to the right on the, on the north side had to be cut away and the slope had to be filled in on the left side, the south side, to, to lay down this pavement. And that, that effort was, was made, cutting away and building up, so that a monument that was created in the middle of the second century CE over Peter's tomb could be encased in this marble box, parts of which are still visible today, in this marble box and set under this canopy as the centerpiece, the focal point of Constantine's fourth century church. And it's no coincidence that the shape of the columns that we see here is imitated on a much larger scale by Bernini in his canopy of the middle of the 17th century. So I want to take us down to the second century monument. It's a little marker, a very modest thing. I'm, it's about my height altogether. These columns, one of which is preserved, is about as long as my leg. A small, uh, pretty humble grave marker built over what Christians in the second century CE certainly thought was Peter's tomb. Presumably some sort of oral tradition uh, provided the evidence for that, the reason for thinking that. In any case, Constantine certainly thought that it was Peter's tomb because he did undertake all that and put out all that effort. Here's the tomb street. That's the Peter monument in the little open air plot. These are all mausolea built later than it. This is the tomb street level. This is the level of Constantine's church and here the level of the 16th and 17th century building. So that all of this focuses on this. This is the Constantinian box and the Peter monument is in part encased within it. Uh, it's possible, relatively easy today to visit all this. When I lived in Rome, it, to bring a, a group of students with me to see all this, took at least two trips, sometimes three. I'd have to go to the Uffici Scavi, which is to the left of the Basilica on the south side, uh, give a number of dates that would work for me, then go back to confirm the dates, pay for the, the excursion, and then go back on the day of the visit to, to, to do it all. Today, you can do it all online. So I encourage you all to, uh, if you're at all interested, to get down to this lowest level and feel the weight of 1850 years of devotion and construction that uh, all of which focus on this really humble little monument. Can't leave us underground. Let's come up and take the whole thing and, and, and the dome, canopy, and everything else highlight and kind of uh, uh, enshrine that monument in the most visible way. A couple of tips for guidebooks. The best Italian guide is this one, and this is the copy that I got in 1974 when I was an undergrad in Rome. It had to be rebound, done very economically in Rome back then. This is the current edition. It's like 400 pages longer, definitely doesn't fit in a, jack in a jacket pocket, but it really is worth lugging around with you because it's got extraordinarily useful information on Rome in every century of its existence. So these are great. The other uh, work that I've got up here is a, a recent edition, a recent printing of Georgina Masson's Companion Guide to Rome, written, it published in 1965 originally and still in print. It's a, an old, an old fa fa favorite that I think will always um, be in vogue. So this is kind of snarky, I suppose, but Tali, did you ever meet her? No, because she, she was alive in our time in Rome. She died in 1980. Um, her, Georgina Masson is her is her pen name. Her real name was um, Marion. I don't know how this, this nickname came along. Babs Johnson, <laughs> uh, an extraordinary travel writer, 
and photographer who left her 5,000 photographs to the American Academy in Rome, uh, Opoteca Unione, so that they're accessible to everyone. So thank you, Georgina Babs, <laughs> for all that. Two excellent archeological guides in English, one by Amanda Claridge, uh, former director of the British School in Rome, and the other by Filippo Carelli, the most important student of Roman topography in the 20th and 21st centuries. So that's it for antiquity. I can't let you go though without, without pointing out the existence of this wonderful book uh, published in 1980 originally by Richard Krautheimer, Rome Profile of a City, which a review described as a love letter to Rome. I think that um, that's a really apt characterization and I'll leave it at that. He was one of those German, no longer expats that I studied with, and it was a rare privilege. So I'm here for questions, but if we want dessert, I've got that too. Thank you all for your attention. Uh, sorry about my... Uh... Sorry about my inability to use this the right way. No question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that. Yes. Yes. I, why? Why do you think? Uh, or... I think it's a, it, it's painted. Left and right, and Bernini did get more of them. Uh, Oh, yeah. is that the the um, the fountain predates the facade? Let's go to that. We'll skip the Karachi dessert. It is his greatest his greatest painting. Here we are in Piazza Navona. So the fountain that you're referring to is the fountain of the four rivers, the main Bernini fountain at the center the center of the square that aligns with the, with the facade of the church. And here you see it. So this figure over here, who's, who you know, Bernini, the uh, um, 17th and 18th and later Wag said he's covering his head because he's so disgusted by Barmini's facade. Well, the that no one else knew. Uh, let's talk about this for a second though. Another, another really great design by, by Bernini. Uh, in a building, an addition, a completion of a building that was begun by a father-son team. We won't bother with their names, but we will mention the name of the Pope who commissioned it, the Cardinal who became Innocent X, the Pamphili Pope, whose palace, the Pamphili Palace, is just out of view to the left. The building today is the Brazilian Embassy, if you, if you know Rome. Uh, the the father-and-son team didn't get around to developing a full design for the facade, and were taken off the job when Barmini got it. He very cleverly, um, and we see this in a, a more kind of a, uh, a reduced way, in a, a more sort of crystalline way, played the concave lower part of the facade against the, the, the concave, the convex. I can't, pardon me, I'm getting myself so confused with geometry. I'm good at this too. The scooped out part with the curving this way part, I'll, I'll act it out, with, with this very broad main element. These two towers that look like they're part of the church are not. These, this is a, a limestone facade that's laid over two adjoining buildings that are not part of the church complex at all. They're, their entrances are on the other street, on Via del Via de Tormilina, I've forgotten what the name of the street is. But um, yeah. The, uh, the Cardinal and Barmini got permission to do this. They paid for it, certainly, and incorporated these buildings into the, into the finished facade design, buildings that were not part of the church space at all. So a very clever way of making the church look bigger and aggrandizing the reputation of the Cardinal patron that um, I've always admired. What's the quality of the building? Is that the, is it the no, yeah, yeah, these, these colors, 
this is limestone here. It's the same limestone that we see down here. It just wasn't cleaned. Yeah, and this ochre is a color that many buildings in Rome were painted in the 19th century, but already in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, well, people noticed that in, in Renaissance and Baroque paintings of buildings in Rome, ochre was not the, the leading color. Pastel colors were, and they started doing core samples, drilling, drilling into walls to see the layers of much lighter and airy colored paint that the buildings had been painted, had, you know, had been colored in preceding generations and centuries. So there's been a pretty consistent move to bring buildings and much of the Centro Storico back to shades that, um, that, that uh, are closer to the original. There's that wonderful church right at the intersection of Via della Rotonda, so the street that, that, took, that with your back to the Pantheon is on the right, it takes you up to Via degli Uffici del Vicario, a wonderful pastel blue building. And looking at that today, I think that since that was, re that was repainted, the old paint was stripped off and it was painted pastel blue. I think they've had to repaint it three times. So that's the charm of ochre. It, it's kind of gross to begin with and doesn't show gross Roman pollution the same way. I could go on with dessert, but I'm happy to. These sculpt no, the, the fountain sculptures, no. The ancient sculptures, yeah. These the, these Baroque sculptures, no. no. Yeah, yeah, they were. Well, the, the bronze originals were probably, if the, if the patron were willing to spring for it, were done decorated with paint, but also with different colored um, metals, like silver for the teeth, or and copper for the lips and nipples, and so on. So there, there was a, a famous um, bronze boxer in, the, in the, the National Museum in Rome, recently restored and on display in New York about, was it for about five years ago? Yeah, that restoration process, conservation and, and cleaning process, really not restoration so much, uh, brought to light the, the remarkable range of color in a work so well known, you know, that had never been noticed before and not much attention had been paid to it. So yeah, color was, and the show that was at the Metropolitan that's been around last year, um, Chroma, is that the name of it? Yeah, literally highlighted the uh, remarkable range of really vivid color that most ancient Greek statuary was painted. Yeah. But, um, you mentioned yeah. That's oh. very unusual, that black. That's, well, yeah. Other... Yeah, it's used, in, it's used in, in other Baroque and I don't like to call that Rococo. I, in Rome, it's called Barocchetto. And that seems to me, let's, let's call it what the Romans call it. Um, no, it's used in other, in other cases, never quite so dramatically. I mean, it's, it, the pallor of his skin, of this dying boy, this, this really milky white against that black, really rich black is um, it's really striking. It's a, it's a really creepy work to be in the presence of, I must say. And I've only seen that about 30 or 40 times. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, I'm really not good at this. No, I just, yeah. the, the black marble of uh, the, the Santa Claus. I can't think of another case in which it's used to such dramatic effect, but I can't, I can't think of many other statues that are that dramatic. It's used in inlays, too, used in architectural decoration. Well, they were painted probably, and it's at about that time a significant, a really slight but significant change. I'm sorry. The question was, in the portraits of of um, Faustina the Younger and Marcus Aurelius, her the, the, the recently betrothed, um, when that port when his portrait was made, the eyes seen blank. Uh, the paint was applied to busts like that into full length statues, and beginning under in the, the 20s and 30s of the second century CE, uh, sculptors start to carve irises and to distinguish sculpturally the different parts of the eye from one another. So that just a little bit of paint would have picked up that difference, you know, the distinction even more clearly. And even with, yeah, I, 
I, I, I pro I've looked at them t for too long. I see nothing but, uh, but sensitivity in those eyes and facial expressions, nothing but that kind of uh, youthful, not hope, but um, the world hasn't gone to pieces yet. Uh, well, I'm gonna I'll, I'll fudge here a bit. For what, what do you mean by Byzantinist? Uh, yeah, there are there are collections of icons. Collections of icons. The Vatican has some really spectacular pieces. Um, I'm thinking in particular of a really beautiful 10th century cross reliquary, a painted cross reliquary. Uh, churches have works that were brought back, uh, looted, I think is the right way to put it, <coughs> by um, Italians returning from the, uh, from the Fourth Crusade, the crusade that was supposed to take the Holy Land, but when that didn't work, they turned on, Byzant on Constantinople and Greece and held Constantinople for half a century or so in parts of Greece down to the, down to the Turkish conquest in the 1450s and 60s. So getting back to the point, not this overview of later Byzantine history. Yeah, there's quite a lot in terms of <coughs> micro mosaics, paintings, uh, Italian works of painting in particular that draw on Byzantine models. I found things to do. I, was, I wasn't unhappy. And I was really working on an early Christian subject. No other questions. I've, I've talked you into submission. <laughs> and I failed to, to repeat that question, too. I really, this, this dog just doesn't learn new tricks. Well, thank you all. That, I enjoyed it. I don't know. And it, it, it,